Hey, congrats, I heard you got with Rachel. I thought she and Josh had a thing. I wonder what happened there. Oh, I made sure he fell in love with someone else. Who? God. <laughs> God, what are you talking? Wait, I thought he was an atheist. Quite right you are. Not only was he an atheist, but a devout debater, ready to intellectually dismantle anybody that was so religiously inclined. And I, for one, did not have the patience nor the temperament to do the research, and so I found a far more effective route, defeating him not on the intellectual battlefield, but that of emotional warfare. The emotional? What does that mean? Yes, but did you know that those with a disagreeable personality type tend to be quite isolated, for whenever they get close to someone, they are apt to disagree and challenge every one of their friend's beliefs. They can be isolating for that friend. And so in reality, although they look quite popular and happy on the outside, the emotion and quality within is quite lonely and sad. And so he was, oh, so powerless to my suggestion, my offering of friendship. Okay, but I still don't see how you made him believe in God. Yes. How familiar are you with miracles? A miracle? <laughs> Not very. Well, you see, people tend to mistake that miracles have to be some type of supernatural event, a parting of the Red Sea, or the cure of a deadly disease, but people forget the humanity and intimacy of personality. Meaning, what could be some insignificant event for you can be the most miraculous event for me. And so for Josh, I knew that I did not need something supernatural, but something rather more tailored and personable to him. Okay, so what did you do? Well, you see, I had the unique advantage of being his friend, and as friends do, they tell each other their problems. And I would ask him, hey, is there anything that I can pray about? And how surprised would I be for him to share with me that his family has grown quite distant from one another, and how he desired for them to be close like they were when they were a child. And right then and there, I knew I had all the ingredients I needed for his first miracle. How did you pull that off? You know, it was actually quite simple. I just took his mother aside when I was visiting his house one day and I just straight up told her, I said, you know, I love your kid, he's a great guy, but he tells me that he misses you. He misses the family and how close you guys used to be and he wishes you guys were warm again. Don't tell him I told you any of this because it's gonna seem forced or superficial. Just say he had a, a feeling, a conviction. And the next week, how ecstatic was he to tell me, hey, bro, your prayers worked, dude. And then he started believing in God. Annoyingly, no, he required one more miracle, but he did believe in the power of my prayer. So he was eager for another prayer request, which came in the form of his father's health. You see, his father works in an office all day, so he rarely gets to see the sun or get any exercise, if at all. And so his health was on the decline. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. What did you do? Well, you see, the following day, his father would receive an anonymous prize for a raffle that he did not enter for a year-long supply of supplements, a stand-up desk, and a desk treadmill. What? Why did you do that? Well, you see, when you're working in an office all day, the element that you suffer from most likely is that of a vitamin D deficiency, which is why I gave him all those supplements. And the reason why he didn't work out is not because he didn't have enough time, but the reason why most people don't work out is not convenient nor easy enough for them, which is why I supplied his gym right beneath his feet at his station at work. And oh, did it work like a charm? His increase in health led to a direct increase in productivity and work performance, which led to a high higher level of confidence, which translated all to his family life and his intimate life. And so, which led to a happier wife, which led to a happier family. And oh, how happy was he to report all these things to me. And every time I said to him, wow, God really loves you. And I knew I had him when he said, yeah, he really does. Okay, so he starts believing in God, but I still don't see how this makes him give up on Rachel. Patience, my friend, I'm getting there. After giving Josh the gift of faith, he grew quite zealous, reading the Bible every day, and outgrew an intellectual curiosity for exorcisms and demons. And it was here that I knew that I'd gained my final piece of the puzzle to complete my master plan. Exorcisms? What did you do? You'd be surprised what transients are willing to do for just $20. Transient? Like a homeless person? Yes, you see, one day when we were walking home from school, we would encounter a homeless person shouting out information that only we were privy to, to convince Josh that this person was demonically inspired, and how quick was he to rebuke him. The power of Christ compels you. The power of Christ compels you. And after saying so, the homeless person would appear healed, calm, immediately thanking him, thank you for saving me, thank you for saving me, and then he would go about his way, and immediately I would say to him, Josh, you have a gift. You paid the homeless guy to act possessed? Yes, and for $20, he was very convincing.
But I still don't get how this helps him stop loving Rachel. Two words, my friend. Christian guilt. What? What? You made him feel guilty about his love? Yes. You see, I made sure to plant the seeds of guilt within our conversations. I would profess the guilt that I felt for lasting after Rachel and how I was hurting my relationship with God. And after his successful exorcism, I made sure that he would encounter another possessed homeless person. But this time, not when he was with me, but when he was with Rachel. What? What for? How surprised would he be to find that he's unable to exercise this demon? And the only changing variable, Rachel. You made him believe that he couldn't help someone because he was in love with Rachel. Yes. And then he would come to me in distress saying that he should have heed my warnings and that his lust for Rachel had prevented him from doing God's work. And then he started quoting scripture that one cannot be a slave to two masters, that he would reject his love for Rachel and accept the love for Christ or something of that matter. But of course, I didn't know how far he was going to take it. Not only did he reject Rachel, but he rejected all women. He took a vow of celibacy and joined the clergy. You turned him into a priest? Yes, and he thanks me for it to this day. Ironically, he's actually quite a good person now and helps a lot of people and has seen miracles without my hand. God works in mysterious ways.